Small towns hide secrets. They're typically really good at it, too, because the smaller the town, it seems the darker the secret they are trying to hide. If you grew up in a tiny Midwest town like I did, you would know this to be the gospel. Southern noir, or Southern Gothic, is a special sort of genre that, when done right, shines a sinister light on those secrets. Add some good old good versus evil to the mix, and the supernatural, and you've got something special. In the case of today's series, you had the best of all of these, mixed into a twisted, beautiful, epic masterpiece that happened to be launched by a master of horror named Sam Raimi, and a jet more known for solving mysteries than writing them, a hardy boy himself, Sean Cassidy. The show is one of my favorite TV series of all time, American Gothic. And on this episode of Horror TV Shows We Miss, I'm going to give American Gothic all the love it never got when it aired way back in 1995. So let's drive on into Trinity, South Carolina, but make sure we don't speed. That sheriff is a real devil. <laughs> American Gothic premiered, surprisingly, on CBS primetime on September 22, 1995. The series had a hell of a pedigree, having executive producers in the guise of Sam Raimi and Bob Tappert, the gents responsible for Evil Dead. Groovy. It was the brainchild of 70s heartthrob Sean Cassidy, his first TV pilot, and one he had written while performing on Broadway. American Gothic would be the first of many series Cassidy would be the creator of, including genre fare like Invasion and Roar. I say it was a surprising home for the series, as it wasn't normal for a horror genre series to be on the network. This would eventually change with supernatural shows like Ghost Whisperer and Evil, but American Gothic was fairly unique on the channel at the time, where the only vaguely comparable show would be Picket Fences, which dealt with an oddball town where a lot of strange things happened. American Gothic was the far more metal version of this concept. The story and mythology within the series was unique as well, while still using some aspects familiar to fans of the genre. The show takes place in the already-you-know-something-is-up named Trinity, South Carolina. The pilot introduces us immediately to the Temple family, again with the religious overtones, who are poor and broken in spirit and in the wallet. Caleb Temple is celebrating his birthday with a cake he made himself, alongside his alcoholic father Gage and his mentally scarred sister Merlin, who can only say the words, Someone's at the door. I said shut up. Leave her alone, she can't help it. When Merlin goes into one of her fits, her father becomes violent, and Caleb has to hide them both away from him. During a massive rainstorm, Caleb runs out of the house to find help, leaving Merlin to be hit in the head by her father with a shovel. As if by magic, the town sheriff, Lucas Buck, and his deputy are there and journey to the house. Lucas arrests Gage, and while thinking no one is watching, finishes off the still, barely alive Merlin by breaking her neck. This is actually witnessed by his deputy, Ben. As the most horrible birthday ever continues, Caleb is taken to the hospital, where he is crosses paths with Matt Crower, the big city doctor come to the small town to work. Matt tries to be a friend to the boy, which puts him in direct competition with Lucas, who has designs on Caleb. Over the course of the series, we find out that Matt was responsible for a horrible car crash while driving drunk, that cost him his family, his reputation, and something that Lucas uses a number of times against him. Strange things start happening to Caleb while at the hospital. Noises, voices, and visions. Eventually, Caleb sees his dead sister Merlin, now an ethereal spirit, perhaps an angel, appearing to him and warning him about Lucas. She can now speak and watch over her brother in a way she couldn't in life. At the same time, in another town far away, Caleb's remaining family, Gail Emery, wakes from a nightmare, knowing that something is wrong back home. She immediately packs up and heads back to her hometown of Trinity to find answers as this was also the town where her parents mysteriously died. It's her meeting with Lucas, which gives us the great line, that's Lucas Buck, Buck with a B. Meanwhile, Ben is having some issues with the fact he witnessed Lucas kill Merlin. Lucas threatens him in a fantastic scene and then gives him some money to go get drunk and think about what he saw. It's at the bar we are introduced to Selena Coombs, a woman with a dual nature that's deeper than Two-Face in Batman. She's the local sex kitten and also an elementary school teacher, and Lucas uses her to seduce Ben that night. Lucas appears with Ben's lucky pin 
and tells the distraught Gage he needs to give all of his paternal rights to Lucas over Caleb. After a guilt-pounding conversation, he leaves Gage with the pen and his own broken thoughts. The next morning, Ben is driving home in shame, and Dr. Crower discovers on a visit to the jail that Gage is dead, Ben's pen sticking out of his throat, possibly self-inflicted? Possibly not. As Lucas stalks down the halls of the hospital, he discovers that Caleb has fled, and when no one else can see the bloody written words, go home, on the door of the room, Lucas can. At this point, we're pretty much 100% that something is beyond normal with Lucas. Gail and Dr. Crower head off to find Caleb, who they have figured out is headed back to his only refuge left, his home. It's there where Merlin appears, and after speaking with Caleb, warns him that someone's hit the door. And that's when Lucas bursts in, coming after the boy once more. Caleb is terrified and runs upstairs. Finding his father's liquor, he eventually sets the house on fire after throwing a match she still had from his birthday candles to ignite the flames. He escapes again, into the rain, as Gail and the doctor confront Lucas. Lucas cries out for Caleb in anger from the window as the building burns. That's a hell of an opening, pun intended, and American Gothic doesn't let up after that for the entire rest of its run. Over its 22-episode run, three of which never aired on CBS, the series evolves into a battle for the soul of Caleb Temple. We learn that Gage wasn't actually Caleb's father, but Lucas was due to an attack-slash-rape that was witnessed by Merlin as a little girl. This was what caused her to become mute and nearly catatonic, repeating the phrase, Someone's at the door. In connection to Lucas, Gage's abuse to his children intensified over this, and Caleb's mother, Judith, killed herself after Caleb's birth. Merlin, as an avenging spirit and possible angel, tries different ways to stop Lucas, who has been in charge of the town of Trinity for a very long time and seemingly doesn't age during any of this. Funnily enough, no one ever seems to comment or be weirded out that Lucas doesn't age. But man, does he know how to work a fawn coat like a champ? And those vests, too. I was a fan of Midnight Collar, don't you dare judge me. A new doctor arrives in town by the name of Billy Peel when Dr. Crower leaves, who falls in love with Selena and tries to discover Lucas' secret as well. Things work out about as well as you'd expect with Selena. American Gothic's dark heart is human nature and what is good and what is evil. Each of us has both in us, and it's a battle of which side will we let win, or if we are strong enough to find a balance. It's also a tell about who we really are underneath. That's why a small town setting is such a perfect place for a story like this to play out, as if you were like me and grew up in one, you know just how full of hypocrisy and lies they can be. The shroud of religion and false piety runs deep as a way to cover up what you are really up to and to wash away any sense of blame. Lucas doesn't let you off that easy. Sean Cassidy and Sam Raimi blended together a great cast, great story, and great mythology within American Gothic. And sadly, with the series' life being cut so short, we didn't get to delve deeper into it. Things weren't black and white, and everything was a shade of gray in this show because the characters were wonderfully imperfect, and that included the children, as well as the quote-unquote good side of things, with Merlin, who has a journey of her own throughout the season. Lucas Buck's powers are mysterious, more only hinted at where they come from. There's some H.P. Lovecraft-esque things happening here, as the theory of what the pineal gland is comes out, black magic is hinted at, and a power that's born and reborn again in the next generation. We see this when Lucas is nearly killed by a blow to his forehead where the gland is, and Caleb is suddenly imbued with his powers and a fascination with the all-seeing eye. All of that power within a 10-year-old boy goes about as well as you would think, and even doubly so when he realizes there's another baby buck on the way, due to a dalliance between Lucas and Gale. This information is brought to him by Selina, who, when the king falls in the form of Lucas, she zeroes in on the prince. This is probably one of the more eyebrow-raising parts of this show, as the scenes begin in a Mrs. Robinson-esque graduate shot, which heavily implies that Selena is willing to do anything Caleb needs as his powers grow. Yes, he's 10 years old, and yes, she's his teacher. It's as dark and twisted as it sounds. I think this heavier nature in American Gothic was part of why it wasn't able to last at CBS. 
it really would have flourished on cable, I suspect. Gail Emery's story as it played out was also interesting. Gail comes originally to help Caleb, but also to find out the truth of her parents' death. She soon discovers the perfect memories of her parents' lives aren't really the truth. She and Lucas have a dance of love and hate with Lucas actually giving her the thing she was wanting, the actual truth. Even though he warns her, she won't like it. He also calls her out on what drives her as a reporter and her desire to find out what secrets lay in hiding within Trinity. I really enjoyed this part of the show because Gail won't admit that there is an aspect of her that is a voyeur and wants to see what others are hiding. When he shows her that bit of truth about her parents the first time, Gail has a very interesting reaction. It's a bit of what makes Lucas who he is as well. He knows all the secrets, and that's part of his power. Let's talk about Lucas Buck a bit more. Lucas is one of my favorite TV characters, and it's because of how he plays. Ben, when Lucas is possibly dead, realizes just what Lucas actually does for the city of Trinity. There are a lot of deals, of course, but Lucas actually does take care of the residents of the town in surprising ways, keeping them safe, keeping them happy, and keeping Trinity in a way blissful. Lucas may or may not be the devil. There's no way to tell how long he's been around because, like I said, he doesn't age and he's been a part of Trinity for a while. He does do deals, but he also speaks about free will. He doesn't really, quote unquote, force anyone into anything. It's their choice. He makes it very clear he will eventually collect on what the bargain is for. Lucas is, oddly enough, fair. Cassidy and Raimi were a great team with this series, with Raimi bringing his signature flair for weird camera angles, surprisingly terrifying images, and very Army of Darkness Evil Dead, and using sound to add to the unease. There's a country quality to the music, but also a rumbly didgeridoo type sound that's similar to a growl and snorting of a bull combined that's used, and I really think it's neat. Cassidy wrote a number of the episodes himself, besides creating the show, and producing, and I love the fact that he worked in a Hardy Boys reference from Lucas when his coffin is open. Let's talk about the actors who really helped make this show special. Gary Cole simply ruled as Lucas Buck. He brought a sense of style to the role and also could go from charming to terrifying with just a glance. You never really knew where Lucas's heart might lay. Was he truly wanting to be Caleb's father or just use him? Did he love Gail or was he just using her to be a corrupted soul who could give him a baby if he needed it? You never really were sure, but that's why it worked. And did I mention the swagger? Everyone knows Sarah Paulson thanks to her massive career in shows like American Horror Story, but she showed in American Gothic the level of acting that would soon become her signature. She was fantastic as Merlin in this and was a great foil for Lucas. She and Lucas Black had a great chemistry, and I really loved her role here as the avenging angel who never got to truly live. It's interesting to me that American Gothic was also the first horror series I can think of that involved resurrecting the ghost of a serial killer and having them run amok, something that would happen in later seasons of American Horror Story. Here it would be Paulson's Merlin who had to take on the Boston Strangler Albert DeSalvo. Speaking of Lucas Black, my god that kid was great in this. You probably know him best from his film work in The Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift and his role on NCIS New Orleans, but I first saw him here in this series. And I mean his name is Lucas Black. He was meant to be in this, and he was perfect as Lucas's son who was torn between the light and the darkness. Paige Turco was fantastic as Gail Emery. Again, her journey was an interesting one that would have been great to see proceed, as she seemed to have inherited a bit of power herself. And I think that's something that Lucas probably knew and would be interested in. Jake Weber as Dr. Matt Brower was also great as the tortured doctor who was just trying to make up for the tragedy his drinking cost. Weber would wind up in another Supernatural-based series with Medium starring alongside Patricia Arquette. But a lot of you probably remember him more for his turn in Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead remake in 2004. Nick Searcy as Lucas's deputy Ben always looked like he was going to be sick due to the amount of anxiety he was dealing with, and that's about perfect for the character. Searcy was great in this and has been in a ton of films and TV over the years, but you probably know him best from his work in Justified opposite the crazy Tarantino film student Timothy Oliphant. 
Last, but certainly not least, when it comes to series regulars is Brenda Bakke, who played Selena Coombs, bringing an old-fashioned type of sultry that was Mae West and femme fatale from hell combined. Bakke is another actor who has a ton of work under her belt, including an episode of Briscoe County Jr. Speaking of Briscoe, guest stars were a plenty on American Gothic, and this would include a number of regulars from Raimi's cadre of regular collaborators. Bruce Campbell would appear as an ill-fated police officer. Ted Raimi, Sam's brother, would appear as well as Arnold Vosloo. Vosloo is more known for his role in The Mummy as the said mummy, but he and Raimi would work together when he took over the role of Peyton Westlake in the Dark Man direct DVD films, as well as his role in Hard Target. He's all he is. Other notable guest stars would include Amy Steele, Veronica Cartwright, Melissa McBride, and W. Morgan Shepard, all of them genre vets. As I said, CBS didn't keep American Gothic around, and it would suffer a fate similar to Firefly years later. Episodes would be shown out of sequence when they were shown at all. Fans like myself were left confused when the supposed finale we served as a part of a special on CBS for the summer, but what they showed wasn't even the final episodes of the season. Those weren't actually aired. After that, the show was gone forever. I actually never got to see the entire run of the series until it was released on DVD in 2005, which I immediately bought, and which is out of print now. And even here, with all the episodes together, they actually aren't in order, at least on the American release. You can find the actual listing of how the episode should be viewed online. American Gothic is available to purchase on Vudu as well as Amazon Prime and Apple TV to stream, and if you can't tell, I highly, highly recommend it. It deserves far better than it got, and we viewers deserved a lot more of it. It's gotten a cult following now as more and more people discover it. It's touching, disturbing, scary, and naughty as all get out. You should definitely take a visit to Trinity sometime soon and say howdy to the sheriff. He's no Andy Griffith, but he'll make sure you have a hell of a time. Sheriff of the year, buddy. <laughs>